Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Daniels, and I'm the program leader for Native Seed Communities, which is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society. We're very glad that you've joined us tonight for Allison Schoff's presentation, Program, Programs and Resources for Creating Pollin Pollinator Habitat. Before I introduce Allison, I'd like to share with you some information on our project, Native Seed Communities, which is a, which, as I mentioned, is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society, and we promote networks of native plant enthusiasts working together to regionally collect, process, and propagate native plant seeds to increase the, the presence of these beautiful and ecologically appropriate native plants in all of our landscapes. Um, as far as our presentations like tonight uh, are concerned, we're devoted to discussing the propagation of native plants from seeds and the spotlighting of organizations and individuals that mobilize native plant enthusiasts to propagate our native plant seeds, but also who take those seed grown plants and get them out into the communities. Um, we have a lot of resources on the web and through social media. Hopefully some of you have already seen those and taken advantage of it. Hopefully you're on our Facebook group. And Bill Lonberg, who's helping me tonight uh, with uh, fielding uh, information, uh, questions from the chat, uh, and also sh will be sharing the information as well uh, in the chat, uh, our, all of our, uh, our links, that is. Uh, Another final note, um, a few final notes uh, for the best experience for everyone, if you'd keep yourself muted, unless you're invited to unmute. Also, as I just mentioned, Bill Lonberg will be taking the questions in the chat. Um, if they're appropriate at that point in time to where it may be good to answer those questions uh, during the presentation, Allison has asked to be interrupted and, uh, and then Bill will ask her. Uh, the questions then. If they're more general, then he'll wait uh, until the very end. But please do ask your questions. All right, well, let me introduce Allison. Allison Schof is the District Conservationist for Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS. Many of us know it by the acronym. She has a degree in forestry from Purdue University and 10 years experience in natural resource management and soil and water conservation. Previous to her current role, Allison was the district manager uh, for Brown County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. And it was there that I was able to, to meet Allison and to learn from her. In fact, she uh, came to our property and did a, 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 an invasive survey of our property. And I don't know, Allison, that may have been, uh, it could have been eight, 10, could have been as much as 10 years ago. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was when I was really, really getting into native plants. And she also helped us with a grant and uh, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable, very, uh, very, very helpful. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to learn from Allison tonight again. And I will at this time, go ahead and turn it over to you, Allison. All right, thank you, Bill. Is my mm -hmm. audio okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, like Bill said, my name is Allison Schof. Um, I am the district conservationist for Brown County, Indiana. So uh, NRCS is, you know, nationwide. Um, and then at a state level in Indiana, there's one of me that covers every county or at least represents every county. So I, um, my office and where I live is in Bloomington, but I spend a lot of time in Brown County. So um familiar with a lot of the state, but this part's near and dear to my heart. So um, I will go ahead and share my screen. And give me a second while I get it to the presentation mode. Oh, and I'm at the end. Go to the top. <laughs> Very quickly. All right. How does that look? Looks good. Okay, great. All right. So I um, originally was just going to go over the, like Bill said, the topic of programs and, and resources um, for creating pollinator habitat. But 
um, it seemed unfair to talk about only that part and not talk about the exciting stuff of actually how to do it. So I've merged kind of two of my presentations together. And so first I'll be going over the kind of nitty gritty process uh, and details of how to create this pollinator habitat. Um, and then we'll segue into the programs and resources to help facilitate that. Okay, first, um, I will jump into kind of the what and the where of pollinator habitat plantings. And so the big key components of that are going to be your site selection, so where you're going to put it, your plant species selection, what you're going to uh, plant in there, site prep, which is getting the ground ready to be planted for these um, native plants, and then the maintenance, um, kind of short-term and long-term maintenance. So site selection, um, you've probably heard the quote um, in relation to pollinator habitat. If you build it, they will come. Um, and I love that because it just means that even if you have a small yard, um, if you've got a big field, whatever, if you plant those plants that they're attracted to, um, you will start to see them um, at whatever scale it is. So I have kind of three um, different sites that I usually see and work with um, with my customers. So lawn is a really great example of people want to convert part of their lawn or part of their garden. Um, but what does that look like for the site prep? So site prep um, is a really important job of doing this pollinator plant establishment, especially if you're doing it from seed. Now, as Bill talked in the beginning, his program kind of helps with seed collection and then seed propagation. So maybe you're starting out with actual plugs, but site prep is still really important for plugs as well. But mostly what I'm talking about in this spot right here is um, doing it from seed. So with a lawn, you'll have to have multiple rounds of site prep to remove that existing um, turf grass. Um, you might consider using a sod remover um, or you doing solarization method which solarization, if no one's heard of it, um, it's where you use a tarp or um, some type of barrier and you put it on the ground and um, you stop the grass from growing by smothering it essentially. So you would do that in kind of the hot parts of the year um, and it kills the grass and it's a really good alternative to not using chemical. Um, and obviously this works a lot better on a smaller scale um, because um, you've got a small, uh, tarping a large area would be really hard. Um, so then we jump over to um, maybe your site is just like a fallow field, um, or maybe it's a it's a hay field that you cut or bush hog every year. Um, usually those are full sun and they've got medium soils. By medium soils, I mean it's not too wet, um, not too dry. That will also require multiple rounds of site prep to get that existing vegetation um, out of there. Um, and you might have to deal with a lot of existing woody vegetation. So that's gonna be a little bit harder or different control to get rid of um, versus your lawn that just has grass. So uh, one thing to think about with that is your access to equipment. Um, you know, is it gonna be just a chainsaw or a brush cutter or are you gonna have to use big equipment, um, like a heavy duty bush hog to get those out. And then lastly, a crop field. Um, and by crop field, I'm referring to like a larger field that's been in like corn or soybeans. Um, and that's the easiest site prep because it's already been in an annual crop. And so you've got a lot of bare soil, um, which is the best for, for establishing plants from seed. Um, again, another thing to consider is your access to a, equipment, and it's really good to plant after a soybean crop um, or a cover crop um, to help with that weed suppression. So the other big thing to think about is what does your site look like? Again, no matter the size, this applies to all um, spots that you're going to be doing your pollinator habitat. Is it um, full sun? Does it have wet soils? Um, what's the texture of the soils? Is the area flat or does it have some slope to it? Um, and are there invasive species present? All this is really gonna factor into 
what you plant and how you get that site prepped and ready to plant. So again, same principles apply to small scale and yards. And I work with these types of customers a lot. Um, and so same thing, check your soil type, your light availability, all that's really important. Um, you can plant from the plugs, seeds, plugs, or potted plants. Um, plugs are going to be a little more labor intensive and same with potted plants, but as you all know, you're gonna get a head start. You don't have to wait on the seed to come up. Um, so there's you know instant gratification of planting a, a plug and it blooms the next year. Um, the other thing I really like about small scale pollinator plantings, it's a, it's a really great intro to plant identification and then kind of a good intro into that management. Um, and then if you wanna take it to a larger spot, you've kind of had your starter area um, before you go into a big, bigger spot. All right, so um, yeah, jumping into the site prep again, um, plan according. So I guess the first topic was really site selection. Excuse me, I think I kept saying site prep, site selection. Um, now we're jumping into site prep um, or site preparation. So plan accordingly. Um, you really want to start planning this out, you know, a year ahead of time, um, unless you get some specialized equipment like that sod remover where you can just remove it pretty fast and easy. Um, but it's very, very important to plant your vegetation into a weed-free seed bed because you just want to reduce that uh, competition from other plants and you don't want to have either your seeds or your plugs or whatever else um, be competing with that. So those weed control efforts should begin as early as 12 months prior to planting and may require multiple applications. And by applications, what I'm mostly referring to is a chemical application. So using um, chemicals to remove the existing vegetation um, that can also be in combination with mechanical removal. Um, if you do the, the solarization or tarping method, um, you wouldn't have to use chemical necessarily, but either way, multiple applications of whatever your method is. And then it's important to treat at different or prepare your site at different times of year to capture different types of um, plants. So like our cool season plants, they grow more actively in spring and fall. So you would wanna uh, control them in one of those months versus those warm season plants and weeds, you would wanna control them um, in the hotter parts of the month, just so you're not missing any um, weeds that might again compete with your plants. And then that woody vegetation that can be cut down pretty much any time of the year. So here's a timeline. Um, so I, I guess I could have asked the group too to kind of um, give me an idea of what your pollinator area that you were envisioning looks like, but let's say it's just a um, 100 square foot spot in your yard, you know, pretty small. Um, we could go up to a half acre, we could go up to an acre, but this timeline would apply to any of those. So you wanna delineate that area, you know, set your boundary. You can use little flags um, to figure out where you're gonna be at and figure out your acreage and square foot or square footage, depending on, you know, how big it is. But that's gonna be really important to know how big your area is because that's going to factor into how much seed you plant, um, how many plugs you plant if you're going that route, um, how much um, chemical you would need. Maybe you're going to uh, mulch the area afterwards if you're doing plugs. So you really need to know how big of an area you're going to be working in so that you um, can plan the materials accordingly. And um, if you're not ready to start spraying um, the spot, you can mow or cut it for hay. Um, and just to keep that vegetation low and manageable. And then you ideally wanna time it before any of the weeds go to seed. And then you wanna do the um, spraying of the appropriate herbicide or doing the solarization. Um, some other methods could be tillage or fire. Um, those last two I don't readily recommend because they can actually make some weeds um, worse, but um, sometimes it is necessary or it's an advantageous tool. 
and then repeat those following steps until your undesirable species is no longer there or it's very little amount and it would be manageable to um you know that it wouldn't compete with your with your plants that you're putting in there and then the planting part um that's going to come in um Usually we recommend a dormant seeding if you're doing it by seed. Um, and, you know, Bill could probably go into more of this than me, but it really mimics um, that seed's natural timeline for the, the native plant would drop its seed um, in late summer, early fall. And then over the winter, um, it would kind of work its way down into the soil. And so we're dropping it out in December and February. Hopefully it reaches bare soil and then it would germinate and start growing uh, the next growing season. And you can either just broadcast that or you can drill it into the ground if it's a large area. Um, another, and then obviously if you're planting plugs, that would be something you plant um, in the growing season. Um, that's a little more straightforward. Um, and another really big thing, hopefully if you guys are all native plant enthusiasts, you've uh, heard this before, but do not use any fertilizer when you're planting these plants. They really don't need it. They're adapted to our soils and fertilizer usually only makes the weeds more problematic and your native plants don't need it. So don't use fertilizer. All right, and then the plant species selection. So I am gonna um, leave these slides up for a little bit and you can kind of think, uh, well, not yet, but when I get to them, you kind of think about the area you have in mind for your um, pollinator habitat and think about um, which of these would apply to that. But there's a lot to choose from. If you've looked on any websites or if you've gone to plant sale, native plant sales, you are probably like, where do I even start? Um, I will say though that diversity is key. Um, so having as many different types um, within a limit uh, is good. Um, and that's because you really want to attract different types of pollinators at different times of year. So whenever um, I put together mixes for uh, my customers, we always start with at least nine species. And that's gonna be three, at least three blooming in early spring, three blooming in the summer, and then three blooming in late fall. Um, you also want to consider a diversity of bloom color, because as you know, certain pollinators are attracted to different colors and it also just aesthetically looks nice. So diversify your color as well. And it's okay to choose a pre-selected mix. Um, so if you get on, different seed companies' websites, they'll have one that says like for shady areas or for um, wet spots or woodlands edge. If you're getting those from a reputable um, native seed nursery, those are perfectly fine to use because the experts have already chosen what's gonna do well for your site. So don't feel like you have to create a mix. Go ahead and use what's already been created. And then, they're not as showy, but it's always really important to remember to add grasses, sedges, and um, legumes, which would be like some clovers um, or other um, legume species. There's, I'll point out some in my slides, but those are really important for other functions like um, for nesting habitat, overwintering habitat. Um, and so don't forget, of, and they can add a lot of good structure to your planting. So just because they don't have a pretty blooming flower um, doesn't mean they shouldn't be added to, to the mix. And then obviously add milkweed to any mix if you're wanting to establish more monarch habitat. Okay, so these are just ones that um, I put together um, that would meet that three blooming in spring, summer, and fall. And so this first mix is going to be for full sun and drier soils. So these are a lot of, in my area in Brown County, um, in Monroe County, these are ones that I recommend a lot. Um, they can, they're very adaptable to a lot of different soil types. Um, the full sun's a little bit harder to get in our area because we have a lot of trees. Um, but if you've got an area with full sun, then these are some really good starters. 
And in this mix, the legume is the white indigo. All right, here's one for partial sun and still dry soils. So again, another really good easy mix. Um, I have a lot of these ones in my planting at my house. And the Golden Alexander does wonderfully, almost too good. Um, so if you're looking for something to fill in your space, that one's great. Um, so yeah, at the end, if you guys have specific questions about these plants, we can uh, talk some, but uh, these are these are pretty easy ones. And again, in the mixture here, the legume is going to be the indigo and then also the partridge pea. That's a really fun native plant. All right, now we move into some wetter soils um, and full or partial sun. Um, I, I personally don't have experience growing any of these ones just because I don't have wet soils on my property, but um, these are all pretty common. So most of the ones I picked to put in these mixes are ones that are pretty easy to grow. Um, obedient plant, if you haven't dealt with that, you know it's not obedient, anything but obedient. So uh, that one is, if you're looking for a quick plant to take over some spots, that's a good one. And then in this mix, the legume is the wild senna. And I guess I didn't mention, but legumes are important because they fix nitrogen in the soil. Um, so, you know, I said it, they don't need fertilizer, but it's still good to improve the nutrient quality in the soil in a, the most natural way possible. And legumes are, are gonna be those plants that do that for you. All right, and here's shade. So, um, you know, again, I said I'm in Brown County, got a lot of trees. This is some go-to plants that I recommend for people. Because even when you think you have partial sun, you probably are more on the partial shade to shade side. So these are a really good bet uh, for plants that are going to do uh, well in those shady sites. And they still have a pretty bloom. And the legume in this one, I might have missed it. Might not have one in this one. I'd have to think about a good legume for shady sites. All right, moving into the maintenance side. Hey, Allison. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question in the uh, uh, chat here. Diana asks, uh, how would I get some of the mixes you're describing? And we, we've had a couple of other participants answer that. Uh, a couple of folks m mentioned Prairie Moon and somebody else mentioned uh, Spence Restoration Nursery. Do you have any uh, others that you would uh, recommend looking at? Those are great options. Um, yeah, you could call those companies and 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 um, tell them these exact plants. Or again, you could just say, I've got a shady spot. Um, I'm looking for a mix for that, you know, with about nine to, nine to 12 species. Um, another really common place for seed is Roundstone Seed Company out of Kentucky. And if you're in the southern part of Indiana, then though their genotype fits well with with uh, the southern part of the state, and then in the northern part of the state, you know, Spence Nursery, um, in those kind of places, Prairie Moon, you know, they're more north, so they they do really well for more of the northern part of Indiana. But all great places. All right, maintenance part. Um, so you've already planted. And now you patiently wait for things to come up. Um, but it's important to remember you can't just plant and walk away. You know, I switched over to a native um, garden because I like the idea of it being really low maintenance, um, which it is, but it's not no maintenance. So don't think you're just going to have a, you know, a wild, um, well, I guess you could, but if you want to keep it. Um, the plants healthy and and keep them thriving, you're going to have to do a little bit of, of work. So um, in that first year, um, and again, this example is kind of you've planted by seed. Um, so if you've planted by seed in that first year, you're going to 
um, mow it really high, uh, you know, 10 to 12 inches um, to reduce the competition from weeds. So you did some really amazing site prep, but there's still going to be weeds that either get blown in or um, maybe your site prep didn't get all of it. So you can mow it in that first year and your native plants will all be doing a really, because they're native perennials, they're going to be doing a really good job of setting their roots. And so if you mow them, it's still not going to um, set them back too much versus your annual weeds. They're putting a lot of energy into making those seeds. And so if you clip that off, then you'll, you'll keep that plant from going to seed. And then as always, scout your area and treat any invasive species that pop up. Um, I say down here, annual weeds are okay. That's true, but you don't want them to take over the entire area. Um, some really common annual weeds you'll see are like ragweed um, and mare's tail and stuff like that, which do have some wildlife value. So some of it's okay, but not an entire field of it. And then second year, you can kind of dial it back on the mowing. And then again, keep scouting and treating those invasives. And then third year and beyond, um, you know, if you think about these pollinator habitats, we're, we're trying to mimic, um, you know, a natural prairie. Um, and prairies, like all ecosystems, they've had disturbance. And so we need to mimic that disturbance over time in our plantings um, to help with, um, you know, the plant's seed production, um, diversity, all those kind of things. So um, common practices that people do for that maintenance um, are disking or spraying, but only on uh, strips. So obviously you're not gonna disc or spray the whole field because that would ruin your planting, but um, small areas of it or in strips are actually really good for um, keeping your stand healthy. And then prescribed fire, um, that could be a whole other session and talk about prescribed fire for pollinator um, planting management, but that's a really good tool um, to use, obviously, um, with some training and or maybe some experts, um, but that's, that's a really good tool to help um, in the future. And then again, oh, I put it in all of these, but it's just really important to keep looking out for those invasives, uh, because even one year of them being able to go to seed could really set your planting back. Allison, so, we, have, uh, we yeah. have another question here. Uh, okay. uh, Becky asks, uh, what do you mean by mowing, uh, literally or cutting back? It could be both. Um, I in, in my description here, I, do, I did mean it literally, but if it's a small enough area, you could just use hand clippers or like some people use um, like an old fashioned uh, scythe and go through and cut it like that. So um, it could be with hand tools or with an actual mower or with a weed eater. Um, so whatever would be most appropriate for the size of your planting. It's a good question. Uh, all right. So this uh, visual right here is really great for people. If you whether you've done something like this or you're thinking about doing something like this. Um, native plants uh, take a while, it, planting from seed again, they take a while to establish. And so a lot of times people uh, get their site planted in the end of year one or even beginning of year two, they're like, it failed. Nothing came up. I, it's all weeds. I totally messed up. Um, but more than likely you did not. So this first picture on top is very typical of what it looks like in that first year. So if you walk through here, you probably would be able to see a lot of small native plants um, and you'd be able to identify them by their leaves. Um, it's kind of hard, but usually can start to say that looks like it belongs here or that just looks like a weed. Um, and so it's OK if it looks like that, um, because in year two, you'll start to see more blooms. And then year three and four and five really is when all the plants will reach that full maturity that um, all be blooming and it's worth the wait. But don't be discouraged if it looks like this in the beginning. This is still really good wildlife habitat. Um, so it's not 
it's not bad and you don't need to redo it. Give it some time and wait and see how it looks. Allison, we, we have a couple more questions here. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Sarah first. She asks, uh, how do you not kill the pollinators overwintering in the prairie when you perform maintenance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you could have some collateral damage, um, but those over, so that overwintering, um, well, I guess let me back up that maintenance, we really recommend doing it on um, like in thirds. So if you had a three acre planting, you would only do that maintenance on one acre and then the next year or two years later, whatever. So you would stagger it. And so um, you would minimize your damage. Um, you wouldn't, um, like say you did a prescribed fire. If you did it on the entire three acres, then your all your wildlife that, that relies on that habitat, yeah, they would not have a place to go and they would have to, they would leave or they would just not um, be as happy there. So that's a really good point. Um, we do recommend splitting it up into halves or thirds. Um, there, again, there is going to be a little bit of collateral damage, but the wildlife that comes in and utilizes it even more after that disturbance um, is is worth doing some of that. And uh, David has a question as well. He asks, uh, what are your thoughts on a uh or advice on a nurse crop like oats? That's great, very good, yes. Um, so a nurse crop or a cover crop is usually included in a lot of these mixes that you buy. You know, I know Spence Nursery, um, they almost always include it in theirs and I definitely recommend it. Um, and for those um, that don't know what it is, just to expand on it, it's an annual um, plant and so oats or oats are probably the most common one, uh, maybe winter wheat, something like that, but it's going to grow up a lot quicker. So like in this top picture here, all these bare spots in that first year, the oats would kind of fill that in and help reduce um, soil erosion, weed competition. Um, it's also going to feed your soil um, and give it some more organic matter. Um, so it's a really good kind of placeholder while your other plants get established and it's an annual so it won't compete with your other plants um, in that process so yeah definitely recommend them any other questions this is kind of a nice breaking point where i move on to the programs and resources side of things All right, hearing none, I'll move on. And then at the end, obviously I can take any more questions. So that was a really fast version of uh, how to, to create pollinator habitat. And now you're like, that's great, but I think I'll still need some help um, or someone to walk me through it or even some financial assistance to help with that. Um, and there's a lot of resources for those exact situations. So I'm gonna step into to what those are. Um, so I'll go over the federal programs, which is more of my wheelhouse um, as a federal employee. Um, then there's some state and local programs and then talk about who is eligible and how to get started. So I work for USDA NRCS, um, as Bill mentioned in the beginning. And so this is a big, big part of my job is to promote these uh, programs, which are available, like I said in the beginning, it's, you know, it's a national thing. Every state has some type of offering of this. So all of you on the call um, could be eligible, and I'll kind of talk in a minute about eligibility. But um, the two big programs that NRCS um, and um, other USDA uh, agencies have for establishing pollinator habitat is our Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or EQIP, we have a lot of acronyms, um, Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP, or CRP, um, which stands for Conservation Reserve Program. So 
the eQuip one is a great introductory um, program and it's available on any type of land in any size. So we talked about yards, we talked about uh, hay fields, crop fields, any of those would be applicable. Um, that price range of what it would pay is very ranging depending on what you wanna do. Um, so it, I, I put a number out there, but it, it really um, could be anywhere in there depending on what kind of mix you're gonna put out. And then the square footage reimbursement is really cool because that gets to help a lot of our people who want to do this on a really small scale, not in acres, but in square feet. And most of the reimbursement through that program is on, um, well, it's a reimbursement. So you get the money after it's been planted. And then CSP is usually that next step to enhance existing plantings. Um, so that's kind of the next level that people go through NRCS. And then CRP um, is also a really great program for pollinator habitat, but it's only for existing cropland. So again, like cornfields, soybean fields. Um, and so it's a little um, harder to have the eligible land for it. There's other grants. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has a partners program. Um, I don't know a ton about it, but um, I I haven't worked on one before, but I know it looks very similar to our EQIP program as far as what it can offer and kind of the price it can offer. Um, so that might be a good alternative for others. Um, and then that's at the, the federal level of fish and wildlife, but then our state level with the D um, DNR Division of Fish and Wildlife, they also have a lot of great programs to improve wildlife. I just went ahead um, and put their uh, link to their website on here um, because they real like they've done what I tried to do in this slide and they compiled a whole list of available resources and they've got um, wildlife biologists across the state that specialize in this kind of stuff and then I'll make a plug for um, our soil and water conservation districts as Bill said in the beginning that's where I was before this job and there's one of them in every county, and they do amazing work at the local level. And a lot of times they have small grants available for this kind of stuff. So that's always my recommendation of where to start to see if there's funding available in your county is with your um, SWCD. That's the acronym for, for those. So who and what is eligible? I'm mostly gonna be talking again about my NRCS program, so the EQIP and CSP, um, cause that's what I deal with the most. Um, so when you start with our programs, um, they're the DC district conservationist, which is what I am, is you kind of your point of contact. And um, in order for them to start working with you um, or shortly after working with you, then you'll have to get um, your property and yourself uh, into our system. And what that does is just gives your property a unique ID number. It's called a farm and tract number. And then your name also gets into our system so that we can um, kind of build what's called a conservation plan for you. A lot of people stop right here though and they say, but I don't have a farm. You know, it's called a farm and tract number. Um, but that's, you know, maybe your property doesn't look like this, or you're like, I don't know if it is a farm. Um, they really redefined what their definition, and by they, I mean USDA, what their definition of a farm is. So these are pictures of sites that I work with a lot now. Um, and so we're, you know, we're considering these um, agricultural lands. Um, and I think in my in my next slide, I'll kind of show you why it's considered agricultural land. Um, once you get a farm and track number, you get, you know, an added benefit to being in the system is you get a map, um, which shows your property. And as you can see on the left here, I've got a really big property, but then on the right here, um, it's covered up, but it's, you know, less than an acre and it's in the middle of town. So again, we've redefined a there's no size limit for what we're calling a farm um, and it doesn't have to be outside of city limits. So a lot of people who didn't think they were eligible for our programs before, um, they, they truly are eligible. 
uh, with the caveat, it must include that agriculture component um, because we are the Department of Agriculture and eligible land means land on which agri agricultural commodities, livestock, or forest related products are produced. So this picture down here, I showed it earlier. It's kind of hard to see and that's on purpose, but can you tell if there's an agricultural product in that picture? There's a tiny little garden right there with like one tomato plant. And so I can work with this customer because they do have a garden, uh, which and they're growing crops. It doesn't matter if it's a large scale or for them to sell, they have an agricultural product on that property. And so then I can work with them to do um, pollinator planting to enhance that, um, that crop. So how to get started. Um, you will want to contact um, the agency or the office to get started. Again, there's one for every county. Um, and if you have questions about that or who to contact, um, you can either reach out to me or just um, do an internet search and uh, put Indiana in RCS and it should show you our state website page and then you can um, go to the contact page and find your local office. And then you'll want to just talk with them and tell them what your goals are about establishing pollinator habitat and then they'll walk you through the process to get into the system. Um, they'll likely do a site visit um, and then if you wish to apply for the financial assistance side of things, then they'll walk you through that process. Um, they can also just advise you on what to do and you don't have to go through the, um, the financial assistance program. So we're also here to just provide free advice. So that's kind of my next step. You can receive that technical assistance. We can help you with a plan, um, seeding recommendations, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we can stop there. Or if you wanna go into the program, um, which is a competitive program, then we would build um, a plan for you in off of your application and um, we would see if it gets selected for funding. Um, and then if it is selected for funding, you would go into a contract and then you would complete the work as outlined in the contract and receive reimbursement. There's a lot of steps in between these steps. Um, I make it seem a little more simple than it is, but um, if as long as you communicate well with your local office, um, it can be a pretty simple process. And I'll just state it again, the wait is worth it. Um, these are some projects. The one on the left is Brown County State Park. Um, uh, they got some mini grant funds when I worked at the SWCD office. And um, I love looking at that every time I visit the park. Uh, but the wait is worth it. Um, there's a lot of benefits to these. As you all know, you're on this call because you are native plant enthusiasts. So you know the wait is worth it. So just to summarize, um, backing up to the beginning part where we talked about the, the actual, um, the planting, you know, know your site well before you start, plan it out, don't just jump into it. Um, site preparation is the most important part. It, it's kind of the boring part because you just want to get your plants in the ground and get going. Uh, but take your time and make sure you do that well, and that will lead to a more successful planting. And then make that seed mix as diverse as possible. Um, again, diversity is why we're doing this for our pollinators. Um, and, and so we want to, um, you know, attract as many as we can. And then the saying goes, if you haven't heard it, it's always good to hear it, or it's good to hear it again if you have. Um, the first year after a planting, it will sleep. The second year, it will creep. And the third year, it will leap. And again, that's referring to the plants in the first year will look a little ugly. Um, you might not see a lot of blooms. That's it sleeping. The second year, it will creep. So you'll start to see a little more and third year it will leap and be bright and beautiful. And then jumping to the funding option side of things and the resources, there's a lot of options out there. Um, federal funding does take longer and requires a little more paperwork, but um, 
that can be good for larger scale things. Um, and then again, check on your local opportunities first. Um, there's other resources for people to advise you on this, like Purdue Extension, um, DNR I mentioned, um, SWCD. So there's a lot of people that can help with these and you don't have to feel alone. And then of course, all the groups I'm not mentioning, like Bill's the group we're with tonight, Native Plant Society, all those um, organizations are a wealth of knowledge. And then just have patience with the whole process and work with your local experts. Uh, yeah, I've already said that, but you don't have to do it alone. So um, that is the end. It was a lot. I'm sure you've got questions. Um, so I will take, take as many as I can. Thank you for your time and attention. Yeah, Allison, we have a few uh, new uh, questions and, and some comments as well. So uh, I'm just going to go down the line here. Uh, Debbie asks, uh, when is the best time to mow? When is the best time to mow? Um, there can, there's going to be two time frames. Um, you know, June is going to be a good time to mow for, again, those cool season weeds that already started growing, like in April, May, June. Um, but if you don't have a lot of growth at that point, because, you know, I said to mow it really high, like 10 to 12 inches. So if you don't have a lot of growth at that point, then don't mow then and just wait until, you know, early August or so. Um, I will say there is some um, wildlife considerations when you're mowing. You don't want for established stands, if you were doing that, some mowing later on when it's really big, you don't want to mow during the nesting period. So you want to wait until mid to late August to mow outside of that nesting period. But for the early mowing for weed control, that can be done kind of anytime the weeds are tall enough. Good question. Uh, the next uh, question comes from David. He asks, uh, where, can, uh, where can you get signs like the ones you displayed? Signs like the ones I displayed. Let's see. I'll have to go back and see what signs I displayed. Or was it this one? You might have to tell me in the that's, chat which sign. That's it. That's it. I don't know, actually. Um, <laughs> I got this offline, but I can um, I can uh, ask or if anyone else in the chat knows. Um, there's a lot of different organizations that, you know, you can put wildlife friendly habitat. You can put. Um, you can have all these like accreditations. Um, so I'm, this one is, you know, more specific to NRCS um, in the ZRC Society. So that's a really valuable um, resource and organization. Um, so I would maybe check their website, but I don't know. Um, usually through a lot of these, you it does have to go through kind of a vetting to see if you truly do have good pollinator habitat or what they consider, um, just like how... Um, Oh, the Native Plant Society has one that you can put out as well in your garden as well. And they want to see a, a picture and verify that it's good pollinator habitat. So uh, this sign specifically, I would maybe check the ZRC Society, which is that bottom logo on it. Uh, Lawrence made uh, a comment. He said that he's currently in the Boston area and that uh, tons of yards are planted as uh, pollinator plots. Nice. That's really cool for a big city like that. That's great. Let's see. Uh, and Shirley asks, uh, can you help to locate the correct agency to contact for other states? She's in uh, Newcastle County, Delaware. So uh, my agency is nationwide. So in Delaware, I would assume you could go to, if you type in your, um, in search in the internet for in RCS Delaware, and then there should be a contact page for your state, and you should be able to refine that down to your county level. So most of our offices are by county. That's how I would search for it. Or you could type in like your county's soil and water conservation district into Google and see what pops up. Um, but yeah, there should be something at least um, in every state. 
And we well, we have a, a kind of similar uh, input from both Debbie and from Shirley. Uh, Debbie said, uh, suggests that uh, almond and swamp milkweed be added uh, as they're preferred by monarchs. And, and uh, Shirley says, uh, butter butterfly weed also. Yes, good, yeah. Try to get a um, milkweed species in as much as possible. Um, the seed can be a little more expensive, um, but um, as much as, yeah, as much as possible, try to get it in there. So great recommendations. And uh, uh, Sarah asked, uh, how many years do these plants usually live? And Zonda replied that uh, as perennials, uh, they should live for many years. They don't, don't know if you have anything to add to that. I will say um, they do live for many years. She is right. But some of them do start to fall out of the system a little more readily. So this picture on the bottom right, that is a lot of bee balm or bergamot and um, a lot of gray-headed coneflower. And those ones, um, they're kind of those early bloomers. They come up and they're really strong in the beginning of the planting for the first, like, let's say five years. And then they start to kind of fall out of the system and more of your longer lived perennials um, take over. Just like in a forest, we've got trees that live longer, some tree species that live longer than others. It's the same for these um, prairie um, plants. So some of them do start to fall out of the system over time. You can add them back in um, by just doing some broadcast seeding, um, or if you wanna do some of that disking or spraying to kind of reintroduce some species, if you want those back in, you can. Uh, there, there's another question here. Are the uh, are the slides with the uh, with the plant pictures available? I think Bill's gonna make. I just need to um, to get this reviewed, um, but then I think he's gonna be able to make this presentation available to you guys um, who registered, obviously, and then to the public. So yes, that will be available to you guys. And, and the last uh, item I see is uh, Amanda made a comment that uh, she believes that Indiana, Indiana Native Plant Society has signs. Back yes. To, back to the sign question. Yes, thank you. I think, I can't remember what the, it's called like Grow Native, I think. Um, and they have on their website, there's a questionnaire that you fill out and you upload pictures of your pollinator habitat and then they verify um, that it's got all natives and then they would send you that sign. So yes, I thank you for confirming that. I, I thought there was something like that out there. And I, I believe that gets us through the, uh, the comments and questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, you've got my contact info. Feel free to reach out. I know that was a lot into a short presentation, but Hopefully, once you get the slides, you can take some time to digest it. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, great, Allison. Thanks so much. I think one thing that really struck me when I, I saw a version of this presentation was the definition of of a of a, a farm, and you know, and also the the components of uh, of agriculture. And I thought that was pretty neat. Anyway, it, it's great, um, uh, Allison. Thanks so much for doing this today. Um, let me go ahead and we'll wind up things a little bit here. Um, so if you have any questions that weren't answered, uh, asked and answered in the uh, chat, feel free to reach out to the the links that were provided by Bill in the, in the chat. Um, uh, also, if you have questions ongoing, feel free to uh, join our Facebook group. Our, it, it, uh, on Facebook, it's Indiana Native Plants, I mean, Indiana Native Seed Communities. So we invite you to join us there. Um, as far as um, uh, next month, uh, our practice is to do one of these per month. We will be having Mary Wells, the Education Director for Sycamore Land Trust. And the title of her presentation will be Milkweeds in Milk Jugs.
growing native plants for everyone. And that's going to be on January the 23rd at 7 p.m. instead of 5.30 p.m. this time. So hopefully we'll see a number of you there. Thanks again, Allison, uh, for the informative session that you provided us, Bill. Thanks again for your help with uh, handling the questions in the chat and the security and everything else. And uh, thankfully we didn't have any technical issues. So really appreciate that. Um, so um, it was good to see you all. Uh, we'll sign off for now. Happy growing natives from seed. Wish you the best. Bye-bye.